Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yep, you never saw it coming. We are on the countdown to Roots Tech 2018. Hey, it is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and this is Extreme Genes, America's family history show, and ExtremeGenes.com, the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. This segment's brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. Welcome, genies. It is great to have you back. We're talking witches today. Robin Mason is going to be my guest coming up in about 10 minutes, and she's put together an amazing resource for anybody who suspects Perhaps you have a witch in your background, and she's got the resources to help you find out more about them, perhaps when and where they were persecuted, what happened to them, what was their fate, did they escape, were they executed? Robin Talks Witches coming up in just a little bit. And then later in the show, the archive lady is back, Melissa Barker, and she is absolutely amazing. She was kind of dragged kicking and screaming into this idea of being an archivist and found out how much she loved it because she just finds so many strange things things in there. Interesting things that you as a genealogist, as somebody who might be interested in your family history, can also find in archives located near you. She'll tell you how to do it, give you some examples of what she's found in her place that are really quite typical of what you might find somewhere else. Hey, just a reminder, by the way, sign up for our Patrons Club at ExtremeGenes.com. Just click on the Patrons Club button and and it's like not much. I mean, the cost to park for a ball game (laughs) would be more expensive than joining the Patrons Club, and you get all kinds of great benefits, including our Ask Us Anything YouTube session every month. We also give you bonus podcasts, early access to the podcast of the radio show as well. We'd love to have you there. Or you can also go to patreon.com slash extreme genes. And right now, it's time to head off to Boston, Massachusetts, and talk to my good friend, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Very difficult to fit on a business card. It's David. Alan Lambert. How are you, David? I'm doing great. We're watching the snowfall here in Beantown on this wintry day. And, and we're getting close to spring training, so this is just kind of the last of it, right? The truck just left two days ago. Did yeah, it? From Fenway from Park. Fenway. Okay, yeah. for your Red Sox. Very nice. Yeah. Well, let's get on with it with our family histoire news today. Where do you want to start? Well, I'm going to start right nearby in Andover, Massachusetts, where a lady had gone into an attic looking for photos for her daughter's school project and unearthed family letters from the Civil War for her great-great-grandfather, a Florence Burke, an Irish immigrant, and he tells all the story of the battles that he was in, and unfortunately, he was killed at the Battle of Petersburg in 1864. Wow, what an incredible find. You know, I think there are a lot of people who have no idea what's in their attic or what's in their basement or maybe in a box in a closet somewhere. Wouldn't it be great to kind of capitalize on all that material, make people conscious of what might be there, and inspire them to go up into the attic and see what they come up with and share it with folks? And we're going to have to talk about this on our Facebook and on our Twitter accounts there, David. I think so. I think you're going to have to come up with a hashtag so people can follow it and then link right to the right. stream How's this? to share theirs. How's this? Hashtag archive in the attic. I love it. I All right. Love it. So that's what we're going to do. Go look in your attic, see what you find, and then let us know, okay? We'll use that. Hashtag archive in the attic. I'm going to start with my own tonight. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. What else do you have, bud? Well, you know, speaking of things that you occasionally can find, I know both of us as collectors have stumbled upon some gems in our days, but in Australia, a book that ended up in a Salvation Army bin, a person at a used bookshop was curious, but there's documents sticking out of it from 1583. Whoa! 1583 in an old book of what? Actually, it's a very curiouser and curiouser topic. It's Alice in Wonderland. (laughs) That's that's bizarre. (laughs) It is. Well, the fun thing about it is that it intrigued the store owner to not just sell it or put it online for sale. They wanted to find out why the book had this piece in it. And they went digging, and they contacted a researcher who believed the document that had been even published in a book early in the 1900s was destroyed in a fire. Now this has a connection for someone to their family back in the 16th century in West Yorkshire, England. 
That's incredible. What a find. And what great detective work, too, on behalf of these bookstore people. Most of the time, all I ever find in books I pick up are ATM receipts. But who knows, in 500 years, those could be worth something, too. There you go. You know, there's a lot of love for genealogy and for people that are seeking to find their past. But how about if your past is more recent, as is the case for adoptees? And there are a lot of people we call search angels that can volunteer and help them go through the processes of having their adoption records unsealed or to even find their original birth record to make that connection. One of the great things, as we both know, is DNA. And with DNA, we can now have these connections that we can find relatives we may have not known we had. I had a cousin pop up out of the blue whose wife wrote to me and goes, are you related to so-and-so? And I said, yeah, that's my uncle. I didn't know he had another son. <laughs> my uncle was dead. The son is in, and he's got a beautiful baby girl. And so I have new cousins because of this. And uh, wow. they've had a reunion with my last surviving uncle, which would be the brother of his dad. And it's great. You know, I tip my hat to these people that help others. Do you think your uncle knew about this son? He had no idea at all. Wow. Well, you know, it just goes to show you that you just really never know what you're going to find. I even have a story of my own family. We have a new sister that was put up for adoption that we'd never known. She found us. So Incredible. We love our sister Donna very much now. Hey, Fish, I know that you're going to Roots Tech, and I'm hoping that some of our listeners are. NEHGS is offering a contest. If you're going to Roots Tech, go to our Twitter page, Ancestor Experts, and enter to win a two-hour consultation with maybe me or one of our other experts that you choose to help you track down your ancestors in your elusive family tree. Wow, that's a fun thing to do, and that's for people who are going to Roots Tech. Excellent. Mm -hmm. We look forward to seeing all of our listeners out there as we're going to have a meet and greet at the NEHGS booth. And I know that you're also going to have a meet and greet with Tom. Tom. Yeah, Tom right. Perry, 1 o'clock on Friday at his booth. And we're actually going to demonstrate a recording on a Thomas Edison wax cylinder. I will be the voice who shouts into the speaker. So it's going to be really interesting. <laughs> That's all I have from Beantown as I watch the snow get deeper and deeper here in New England. Talk to you later, my friend. All right. Thanks so much, David. Coming up next, researching your witch ancestor in three minutes with Robin Mason. Hey, Genies, it's Fisher, and whether you're new to family history, a seasoned pro, or you've simply missed the event in years past, now's your chance to connect at Roots Tech. It's the world's largest family history conference. Now, you can join everybody for four days of discovery and make connections to your past, enjoy world-class entertainment, interactive booths, and hundreds of hands-on classes. Listen to celebrity speakers like former Olympic gold medalist Scott Hamilton and Brandon Stanton, the founder of the Humans of New York photo blog and Henry Louis Gates Jr., host of the hit PBS show, Finding Your Roots. Purchase your four-day Roots Tech Pass today and save over $80 on a regularly priced pass. Learn the latest about DNA. Explore recently released record sets and interact with exciting technology. You can join the excitement and the fun. Discover your family. Discover yourself. Discover Roots Tech. Roots Tech 2018, February 28th through March 3rd at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City, Utah. Register at RootsTech.org. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. 
Genes.com. Hi, Genies. It's Scott Fisher, host of Extreme Genes, with an invitation for you to join our brand spanking new Extreme Genes Patrons Club. Now, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is where, for as little as a dollar a month, Genies everywhere can take advantage of Extreme Genes rewards, such as early access to our latest podcasts, members-only bonus podcasts, acknowledgement on ExtremeGenes.com, and special monthly live online question and answer sessions with well-known family history experts. Catch visits with genealogy stars such as David Allen Lambert, photo detective Maureen Taylor, DNA expert C.C. Moore, and many other experts and storytellers. If you find yourself craving more stories, more ideas for digging up your dead, more inspiration, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is for you. The rewards start at just a dollar a month. Find out more now. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on our special Extreme Genes Patrons Club link at the top right. Or go to Patreon.com slash Extreme Genes. And welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is brought to you by LegacyTree.com, genealogists. And, you know, I've been talking a lot the first part of the year about my little discovery about finding a pirate in my line. And it's interesting. I think we all have ne'er-do-wells in our past. And, and some are a little less interesting than others. But when somebody falls into a broad category like pirate, everybody lights up. And the same can certainly be said for witches, which happens to be the specialty of my next guest, Robin Mason. She's in Bedford, Massachusetts. She's the one behind witchesmassbay.com, which is the witches of Massachusetts Bay. Hi, Robin. Welcome to Extreme Genes. Why, thank you, Scott. What got you going on your witches? So my fifth grade class went to Salem, Massachusetts, and we went to the Salem Witch Museum and the Wax Museum there, and I was hooked. That was all I needed. Now, do you have any ties to the Salem Witch Trials yourself? I do not. I have connections to other witch trials, but my family is on the accuser side. Oh, okay. So they're the ones who are putting people in jail. Right, right. And well, I have that kind of thing, too. In 1653 in Fairfield, Connecticut, I had an ancestor named Susanna Lockwood. Her maiden name was Norman, and she was one of the accusers of Goodwife Knapp who was ultimately hung, and it was just a brutal story to read about. So let's talk about your website, because this is very fun for anybody interested in tying in, in particular in this case, with the witches in Massachusetts Bay Colony. And uh, these all go back to the 1600s. You've got a whole list of different towns here uh, on your website, Amesbury, Andover, Beverly, Boston, uh, and I have no connections with any of them. Still, I am fascinated by what some of the stories are about some of these towns. Tell us about one of these. It's maybe one of your favorites. So everybody thinks that the Salem witch trials were only people from Salem, but Salem is really the place where people went to the court to be accused, and then they were hanged there. But all these other towns, there's like almost 20 towns that were involved in the Salem witch trials. And the one that started it all was Salem Village, which we now call Danvers. Right. And that has been under the radar as far as the tourism, but there are some cool sites to see, like the original old house of Reverend Samuel Paris. He was the minister, very contentious man, and he was always fighting with the people in Salem Village. And I think the stress of it got to his daughter, Betty, who was nine years old, and she started having these weird fits. So she would be stumbling around. She would be saying something's in pain. She'd be twisting her body. She'd be throwing herself in the fire, just weird Uh, stuff. Mental illness. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then her cousin started doing the same thing, and she was like 12. And so people were wondering what on earth is wrong with these girls. And they brought in a doctor, and and he said, well, it's witchcraft. And then more people started getting the same symptoms. And as the symptoms grew, more people were accused. And and is this where Rebecca Nurse's homestead was also? Danvers, as I recall? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. 
And, and that's beautiful. It's well preserved. There's a caretaker who does live on the site. So you can go into part of Rebecca Nurse's house. And what you're walking through is going to be the original part where she had her kitchen. And also on the same lot, there's a couple of other buildings. And one is a replica of the Salem Village Meeting House. And that was used in a a movie. So it kind of gives you a real feeling of what it felt like to be in Samuel Paris's church while he's ranting and raving about witches and devils and and whatnot. The chair is kind of impressive. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I look at your site, and this is really good stuff, because if people want to plan a trip to a place like Salem or like Danvers, you've got great references there for that. But also, if they just want to research something about the area or their ancestors from that area, there's so many people with New England roots, this would make a great deal of sense because you've linked to online resources there as well. Right. And to some libraries, in case you want to contact a librarian and say, will you do some research for me? Because some of them will do it for a fee, you know, look up obituaries or sure. records or what not have you. And I also included some events that are related to Salem witch trials or they're related to the 17th century. So it reminds me to attend these things because I was really upset I missed one Uh that I would have loved to have gone to. (laughs) I got (laughs) you. Well, uh, let's talk about some of these other towns here now. Where is Peabody, Massachusetts, and what's the connection with witchcraft with that town? So Peabody used to be part of Salem and is part of where John Proctor used to live. He was hanged in 1692. He originally lived there. His house is still there. Wow. It doesn't look like an old house, but part of it is. And then Giles and Martha Corey also lived there. He was famously pressed to death for not giving a plea in the courtroom, and his wife was hanged a couple of days later. Now, as I recall, if you actually admitted to it, then they would spare you the death penalty, yes? Sort of. (laughs) Okay. Sort of. Judge Stoughton really wanted to get everybody who had anything to do with witchcraft, especially the ones who confessed, he wanted to get rid of all of them. Mm -hmm. But he was stopped from doing so. Governor Phipps was like, yeah, no, we can't keep on killing off all the neighbors. But there is one guy who was accused, and then he decided to come out and say, oh, no. I'll confess to this, thinking it was going to prevent him from being hung. But he was hanged anyway. Wow, that's incredible. He was incredible. one of the last guys to be hung. Now, Stoughton was actually a, a cousin of one of my wife's ancestors. And it's funny because all of us can kind of find some, at least a roundabout way, to connect sometimes with uh, some of these witch trials, if they have any kind of New England ancestry at all, right? I mean, because there are just so many descendants now. They just figure, how many? I'm, I'm hearing tens of millions descend from people tied to witch trials, either from the judges, the jurors, the accusers, or the accused. Absolutely. There are so many people who are related to Rebecca Nurse and her two sisters, I call them the town sisters because that's their original name. And two of them were hanged and one survived and escaped. And a lot of people will say, oh, yes, I'm related to them. And I get it online all the time. So by the time it's the 10th generation, you're talking a lot of (laughs) ancestors on your own Exactly, yeah, just tons and tons. Let's talk about your research drop down here, Robin. This is amazing because you've got the list of everybody who was accused of witchcraft from 1620 to 1691. Now, 1620, of course, is when the Mayflower arrived, and I'm assuming there weren't any accused witches in the first couple of years because there just weren't that many people here. They were way too busy for that. When was the earliest accusation that you actually were able to find? Well, the one that we know of is 1648. Okay. But there are people who have accused others of being witches, and you'll find them under slander in the court records. Unless it says she's been accused of witchcraft, you don't know if it really is that, but you can kind of assume it is. 
You've got this uh, one drop down, though. You say accused of witchcraft from the very beginning, from when the Mayflower arrived in 1620 up to 1691, which was the year before the Salem trials, which is what all of this ties into. How many people before Salem do you have? And this is just Massachusetts. There are other states, like I mentioned, the one in Connecticut that I have ties to from 1653. But how many did you have in Massachusetts for those 71 years? So it's about 30 Although some people would go higher, it depends if you, like, count Hugh Parsons was there a couple of times. And on this list, you'll see people who were accused and actually hanged in Salem. So, like, Susanna North Martin, she was accused in 1669. Well, she was hanged for it in 1692. So... A couple of people show up a few times, and Bridget Oliver is who we call Bridget Bishop from Salem in 1692. Wow. She well, had three husbands. So. Th- these lists are just absolutely amazing. Family connections, place names, digital collections and books, digital records, multimedia online. If you want to research your witch that ties back to uh, early New England and Massachusetts. Robin has it all on this website. It's witchesmassbay.com. And you can find out about road trips you can take to these towns, special events that are happening there. She writes a blog. You can subscribe for more. But, uh, Robin, this is really fascinating stuff, and I really appreciate your time and all the effort that you've put into putting this whole thing together because I think we're all fascinated by the witch trials. They're, They're just amazing things that happen, and it's hard to imagine that it did happen. True. Well, I think that the key to the the trials really is that it hasn't gone away. No. Today, there are witch trials in Africa. Okay. People wow. People are accused of, of witchcraft and they're killed for it. And I think the witch trials also, it's about discrimination and social justice. And we can all learn something from hearing their stories. She's Robin Mason. She's the one behind witchesmassbay.com, witches of Massachusetts Bay. Great resource for all of us. Thank you so much, Robin, for coming on. Enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much for having me. And coming up, Tales from the Archive with the Archive Lady, Melissa Barker, in five minutes on Extreme Genes. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Hey, 
it is time to talk archives at America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and this segment is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. And some time back, I made the acquaintance of a woman who calls herself the Archive Lady. And she actually started an archive in her community in Houston County, Tennessee. And you didn't do it without a little kicking and screaming, as I recall, Melissa. No, I was kind of, I guess you could call me a reluctant archivist, but uh, <laughs> I wish I'd have found this job about 20 years ago because I absolutely love it. Isn't that crazy how it works? Well, you know, when I say archive, I think there are a lot of people who, oh, they cringe. It's like going to the school library <laughs> and having to go through books and documents. But I will tell you, that is where the genealogy gold is sitting in many cases. And of course, you've been on the show many times before, Melissa Barker, and we have talked about some of the incredible things that are available there in archives, not only where you are, but obviously across the country. And that's kind of why we do this segment is so people can understand what is possible. And you're always finding new things, not only within your community, but within the archive that you may not have even known you had. So where do you want to start this week? I'll tell you what, let's start this week with some Houston County School Minute Books. Now, wait a minute. Are, are school minute books something we can get anywhere? Uh, it depends on if they were saved, but most of our local school boards kept minutes of their meetings. And a lot of times, and in many areas, they have been kept over the decades, and they are actually chock full of information about our ancestors that actually went to school taught in school, and believe it or not, you can find information in them about your ancestors that didn't even go to school. Really? Now, why would that be? (laughs) Well, because in school board minutes, everything is talked about, about the schools, and especially if you can get a hold of school board minute books before the consolidation of schools in the 1960s and 70s. Because before then is when we had the one-room schoolhouses that were dotted all over in our communities. Right. Now we're down to just the two or three or four in the whole county. But those little one-room schoolhouses, you know, it took a lot of people in the community to keep them going. And so you can find your ancestors that didn't go to school that actually maybe worked for the school system. Maybe they delivered coal to the local one-room schoolhouse and they had to send in an invoice to get paid. Wow. So that's the kind of thing that's in there. Any of it kept in like a diary style? Yes. School minute books are usually in one of some of those big, you know, books that we see all the time. And they're by date. And you can look them up. And each meeting is dated. For instance, I have an example here on July the 3rd, 1908. This is one of my favorites. It says, all teachers shall be instructed to prohibit dogs from staying or prowling about the schoolhouses while school is in session. (laughs) <laughs> so the rules were mapped out right there, and this is because the local school board set them, right? Exactly. And can you imagine being a teacher and part of your job is making sure the dogs aren't around the schoolhouses? I right. mean, don't you have enough to do? <laughs> <laughs> you would think. Well, what does it say about some people individually in some of these records that you've got? Well, one of the most interesting things that I have found in our school board minute books are contracts for school bus drivers. Uh, There was a Solomon J. Rye on August 4, 1934, entered into contract with this local school board to be a school bus driver. Now, I know from family here locally that he never attended school himself, but he was a school bus driver. And so he's in the local school board minute books. Yes. That's crazy. Yes, it's crazy, and he was tasked in the contract. He had to supply the fuel. The school supplied the vehicle. And also in these contracts, if you're looking for information about local schools where your ancestors attended, the bus routes are even listed in detail in these contracts. <laughs> and you know what's <laughs> fun about that is if you were to write a story about your ancestor and maybe wanted to bring it to life a little bit, you could talk about, well, he got on the bus here and then he took the route that went this way and could describe the detail of one of the routines of one of your ancestors' lives. Exactly. And I, the last example I have for you on these minute books is actually my husband's grandfather. Really? I, yes. One of the most wonderful things about working in a local archives where my husband's family is from is coming across information about his family. And his grandfather, Conley Stringfield is his name, on November 14, 1941, he was paid $3 for working on the local Stewart School. 
Okay, and that was something, of course, you wouldn't have known, and probably he didn't remember himself in the old days. Exactly, and guess what? He did not go to school either. (laughs) So you're finding people who never went to these schools, and yet they're showing up in the school board minute books. Another example of what you can find at local archives wherever you are. So what else have you come up with lately, Melissa? We actually had a couple of wonderful donations of records. We get donations of records from people all the time, and that's where lots of genealogy gold is found. We had a lady come by, and she brought me some books, and she said she had been at an estate auction, bought a box of books, and these two particular books were in the box. When I got to looking at them, they were diaries. Oh, And I thought, oh, great, diaries and juicy stuff's going to be in here. (laughs) And so when I opened them up, they were different. These were work diaries for a priestly E. Clark. He worked for the L&N Railroad, which is the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. And these diaries dated from 1935 to 1938. And it was just his jotting down his daily work, what he did every day. How fun is that? That would be a great diary to find. Have you found any family members related to this person? Actually, our county mayor is a clerk, and he is related. How about that? So have you had him over to look at this? He actually has looked at them and has found them extremely interesting. And the entries are only like one-liners. It'll say, like, went to Danville to repair the trussel, went to Clarksville repairing steps at the foreman's house. But the most interesting thing, and you know me, I love to get to know my ancestors. I want to know what they had for breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) And in the back of his diary, it lists his wife, who is Zella Clark. Okay. And it lists his shirt size, his hat size, (laughs) and his shoe size. Wow. Well, that's kind of unique stuff. And, you know, some people who may have the bigger picture of uh, family history go, well, how's that fit on my tree? This is the detail that really brings some of these people back to life. It's the Lazarus effect, right? Exactly. Now I'm trying to figure out how I can connect my own ancestry to Priestley Clark. So I can claim these records. (laughs) You want to know this guy even better. What is the relationship, by the way, between... Between Priestley Clark and your mayor? A great uncle. A great uncle. Did he know him back in the day? He did not. He he passed away before he could know him. All right. Real quick, what else have you found lately? We've got about a minute to go here. Okay. The last one is kind of a sad thing, but it tells you that everyone has a story to tell. We had some records donated on a Cliff Anna Wright, and her father's name was Cliff, and her mother's name was Anna, so she's Cliff Anna. (laughs) She was born in 1934 and died at the age of 18 in 1952. But there's a whole box of records that were saved. And she graduated from high school in 1952, and in the box is a scrapbook, there's photo albums, there's letters to her best friend talking about her wishes and dreams for the future, and her acceptance letter from St. Thomas School of Nursing in Nashville that she received two months before she died. And what did she die of? The death certificate actually says, cause of death unknown. Oh, well, hopefully you can find some family that will be benefiting from those records. That's incredible. It is, and it goes to show you that our archives are full of wonderful records that are just sitting there waiting for genealogists to discover. Exactly, and that can be anywhere in the country. You've got one near you, and that's why archives shouldn't make you cringe. They should kind of get you excited. It's like going through Grandma's closet, the way I look at it. Absolutely. She (laughs) is the archive lady. She is Melissa Barker. As always, Melissa, great having you on the show, and we look forward to talking to you again. Thanks, Scott. And coming up next, it's time to talk preservation with Tom Perry on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. Well, we all have something that needs to be preserved, and that's why we keep this guy on board. The Preservation Authority, Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and this segment is brought to you by MyHeritage.com. And uh, Tom, good to see you again, sir. Good to be here. Totally excited. If I was any more excited, and as a piece of dynamite, I'd explode. Okay, and uh, <laughs> we've got an email here from uh, Michael Levine, and Michael asks, do you know of a program that could attach a wave file to a picture? Ooh. And this, now, see, here's a guy who's thinking out of the box, but as I think we've all learned in this day and age, we think we've come up with something new. There's always someone out there who's thought of that, and in our case, that would be the madman himself, the mad scientist, Marlo. Exactly. Heritage Collector. And, and what he says here, Michael says it would be great to be able to interview someone while having them look at a picture and have the picture and the audio attached together for future viewing and listening. And that's exactly what Heritage Collector does. Oh, it's absolutely perfect. So many different ways. Just like one of the examples let's talk about is you can make up a calendar and have a photo of grandma or whatever and have a QR code in the corner. Anybody with a smartphone can just shoot the QR code and it'll bring Aunt Martha talking to you, telling her story, describing what this photo is or a group of photos. You think this would be hard to do, but this is really, really simple. You get Heritage Collector. It's like what I call family history preservation for dummies because it's so easy to use. Yeah, yeah. And Marlo does at least once a month. He does these webinar-type things that are all free. You can sit there and watch it. You can actually interact with him. So if you've run into some kind of problem or you think, hey, a light bulb goes off, this is something that would be cool. Present it to Marlo. If it's not in this software already, next month it probably will be. (laughs) It's really true. This guy has devoted his life to creating these things and making this better and more accessible. And your idea, Michael, is absolutely dead on. I mean, what a great idea to have somebody talking about who's in a picture. I was just talking to my wife's mother's cousin the other day. She's very senior. She's going to be sharing some photos with us. 
And it just about made me fall over when she talked about the hundreds of pictures she's already thrown away uh. because her kids and grandkids would never know who any of the people were in the picture. Now, you uh. think about this. If those were scanned and you could take a wave file or even an MP3 and attach it to a photograph and have her actually explaining what the picture is about, those would all be worthwhile photos to preserve. In fact, when people come into our store, people write us emails. I always put at the bottom of my information going back to them or a conversation I have. I say, now make sure you take this stuff, go back to grandma or grandpa or mom and dad, whoever it is, and sit down and record them talking about this. And if there are people that don't like to be recorded, use your smartphone. There's free apps to turn it into a, a digital recorder, a voice recorder. And don't tell them what you're doing. Just leave it in your pocket and they'll still get good sound. And then you'll be able to have that. There is no reason to ever throw a photo away. Even if you don't know who the people are, somebody out there knows who they are. Well, I'm grateful for the fact she says she's kept the oldest ones. And <laughs> she's described a couple that are going to be real gems for the family, like my wife wife's great-grandfather and his three siblings all together. We don't have any photo like that, so it's going to be a lot of fun. But imagine to get the audio of somebody who knew these folks talking about them a little bit and the history of it attached to the picture. It's a great way to go. And Heritage Collector, I think... I don't know this, Tom, but is that like the only software that you can use that does this? It's the only one that's a complete turnkey solution that will do everything. And the neat thing about it is when you're buying, say, your Maserati, you don't have to buy a navigator if you don't need one. You might like your Garmin. You might not want one built in. You might not need leather seats. That's how Heritage Collector is set up. You can buy one module to get started and then buy the next module like you're building a house. Right after the break, if you can't afford to scan your photos, I've got a way that you can preserve them for free and put audio tags on them. All right, coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. Hey, 
Okay, we're back for our final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show for this week. My name is Scott Fisher. I am your radio root sleuth, and we're talking preservation with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. And Tom, we're, we're talking about this email we got from Michael asking about attaching a wave file to a photograph so people can actually describe what's in the picture. And he was wondering what software might do this, and we recommend Heritage Collector. We should mention, by the way, we have no interest personally in Heritage Collector. Nope. <laughs> We're just big fans of this particular software. Yeah, we just love Marlo and the work that he does. It's incredible what he has done for this industry. What I was explaining before, so many people want to do a slideshow. It's not really that expensive. However, if you have no budget, you have no budget. If you've got a smartphone, a video camera, anything, all you need to do is set it up on a little tripod, get out the pictures, and hold them down so they're showing on your device, whether it's your iPhone or whatever, and hold them in front and talk about them. Then take up the next picture and talk about it. Take up the next picture and talk about it. And if you're there with your mother or your grandparents, have them sit there too and just talk about the pictures. And with an iPhone or any kind of an Android device, any of those smartphones, you can go in when you're done and edit it right there. You don't have to have any special skills. All you have to have is two fingers and say, okay, I want this part, cut this part out. It's so easy and it's totally free. So if you have those photos and you can't afford to even get a shot box to be able to scan them, this is a way that you don't even have to scan them. Just hold up your camera or your video recorder or an iPhone or any kind of a smartphone device and hold it up. And as you're looking at the pictures and you and mom or whoever are talking about who the people are, because too many people say, I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm going to do this tomorrow. Then they come in and say, can you do the funeral video for them? Yeah. Because we ran out of tomorrows. Exactly. So there's no reason not to do this. It's totally simple. It's free. It can't be any easier. If you go, oh, well, I don't, all I've got is a dumb phone. Well, I guarantee when your kids have a smartphone or when your neighbors, (laughs) or get a hold of one of the little kindergartners down the street and have them come and do it for you. Isn't that funny how easy it is for the kids who grow up with it? They just understand. I get calls from my grandson. He's he's six years old. They're wired different. They are wired differently. That's exactly. Another thing, I got an email just the other day from Leanne Evans. She has some 8 millimeter old movies that she wants to have scanned, but she doesn't want any titles or anything like that. She wants to do it herself. This is basically the same kind of thing. All you need to do is get your digital file. Then once you get your digital file, just set up your camcorder and talk into it and say, hey, this is this, this is this, this is this. And it makes it so easy. In fact, if you can afford the top line shot box, the most expensive one they have is only $200. You can put your photos in there, set your camera on the top, and put it on video mode instead of photo mode, and then just keep changing the photos and talk about the photo, then move it, talk about the photo, move it, talk about the photo. So you've got all the photos recorded, you've got the narration down on it, and you might even want to make up some little cards. You might want to write, our Christmas vacation 1976, and put those in with the photos. So when you're going through the photos, not only is it a reminder to you, oh, now we're coming to Christmas 1976, it's a great title. It makes it so easy, and it's almost free. Yeah, absolutely. And just a reminder, by the way, coming up, Roots Tech, we're going to be demonstrating an old Edison recorder on a wax cylinder in the Expo Hall. And that's going to be at 1 o'clock on Friday, March 2nd. So this is going to be a lot of fun at Tom's booth for TMC Place. Yep, we'll be there. We'll have the Extreme Gene stuff there. I'll have one of my employees that just, I mean, he's only 16 years old, but he is so into this old stuff. And he's shaving them, getting them all ready, and it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, Tom. Good to see you again. Talk to you next week. My pleasure. Hey, we covered a lot of ground today. And if you're listening on radio and you missed some of it, we'll catch the podcast. We post it every Monday at ExtremeGenes.com, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and iTunes. It's easy to find. And you can also join our Patrons Club. It's your chance to support the show for less than the cost of a breakfast at McDonald's each month. We give you bonus podcasts. We give you early podcasts and a monthly Ask Us Anything session on YouTube. So we'd love to have you be part of that. You can also sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter. It is absolutely free. Just find the link at ExtremeGenes.com. Hey, and don't forget to sign up for Roots Tech. It's coming up real quick in Salt Lake City, Utah. Go to RootsTech.org. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family.